we have marked um, the pre-sentence investigation reports for both defendants uh, as exhibits. And as I mentioned before, uh, court pre opened up the sentencing memoranda that was offered by the state included with it the certified copies of the juvenile court records and uh, conviction for both defendants. And we would ask that the court recognize uh, those items as well as part of the proof in this particular hearing. Which, uh, one is exhibit one? Is that Mr. Davis? Mr. Davis. Yes. Uh, so Mr. Davis, yes, I'm exhibit one. Uh, Mr. Jordan, exhibit two. Mr. Davis, yes, I'm exhibit one. Mr. Jordan, exhibit two. Regarding their juvenile um, uh, records, any objection? Uh, Mr. Davis, on behalf of Mr. Davis. No objection. Uh, and then he's exhibit three, I'm going to assume. Yes. Yeah. And then so exhibit four would be uh, Mr. Jordan, any objections from that? No, you don't. Great. And so this exhibit is one My name is Starling Gum. I'm the grandmother of Stanley Freeman. Can you spell your last name? N G O M. Um, um, first, I want to say. I really miss my grandchild. And also, also, on February the 12th, 2021, when you all decide to take my grandchild's life, it's also destroyed my life and also my family. And it's going to take a long time. I don't think that we will ever have closure. And prior to that, I have had two surgeries. One of them about took my life. Oh, Jesus. And I want to thank the judge and everyone that participate in this matter. That's all I have to say. I'm uh, Danny Freeman, uh, great uncle, and my name is Clifford Bishop, C L I F F O R D B I S H O P. Okay. Sir, if I can show you a series of photographs, do you recognize the individual in these photographs? Yes. Yes, it's Danny Freeman, Jr. Are these different photographs taken throughout his life? Yes. I'd like to make these collected. No, you have to be collected. We're going to make this um, actually uh, addendum to the victim impact. So I'm uh, receiving these photographs as an addendum to his victim impact testimony. Thank you. Tell me, please, sir, how this is affecting you. Hey, uh, this has been one, you know, really hard for especially for uh, his father. Um, and it's really been hard for me because I took him to the very school that took his life. I used to pick him up in the morning and take him there. And I'm not saying the school took his life. I'm saying that him leaving that school uh, took his life. I think what my family want to know is why. We, we never got to the why, you know. 
And we just at this point, at this point, you know, we just, it's just hard to move along when you, uh, you lose someone so young. He, uh, Stanley, he was a, a good guy. He, he wanted to have a family. He wanted to, you know, be here today, but he won't. He, would, he, he won't have that chance to be here. Uh, the defendants are still, they still here. They get to eat, they get to sleep. They get to go on, go on with their life, Where, wherever it may be. They still, they still here. Stanley Freeman is gone, never coming back. And uh, yes, it has really impacted uh, our whole family, especially his, uh, his father, his uh, sister and brother. Uh, and you know, there's something you, you, you don't get over. Uh, you know, we just, I'm not at that point where uh, I can, you know, move on and forgive. I mean, maybe we'll get there one day, you know. But right now, uh, this family is, is torn apart. And, you know, for him to be the person that Stanley Freeman was, was a, a part of this family where we had great hope, he, you know, hope for him and to do great things. And, and uh, he, he was trying to get his education together so he can uh, have better things for himself, his, his family, his mother, his, uh, his uh, you know, his brothers and, and his sisters. He just wanted, want, 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 wanted better for their life. His life was taken, uh, like I said, we don't know why. We just don't know why. Uh, so, it's, 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 it's continues still to be hard and, and uh, it, it, it has affected our family mentally as, you know, we're just trying to put things back together, but it, it's just hard. And I, so and I appreciate, uh, you know, the, the police department, you know, the work that they've done, the, the special uh, forensic department, you know, and I, I thank them. And I, and I thank the mayor of Knoxville because uh, she, she has, uh, I mean, you know, I, I wasn't even going to say this, but she made, made our family feel uh, at the beginning that something will be done. And I, I thank you for that. Uh, and, oh, one more thing. And, I, and I'd like to thank uh, Ms. Fisher, you know, uh, I mean, she, she's really been, been I mean, uh, she was more than uh, just a prosecutor. She made us understand what was really going on. And I really appreciate it for that. All right, thanks. I'm Stanley's sister, and my sister is Aya Kyle. Well, February 12th, I lost my brother to just nothing. Like, I don't understand, you know. I never will understand. But he was a big impact of our family, you know. All he wanted to do is work, play basketball, and just go see his girlfriend. That's all. That's all I ever knew, my brother. I just want to know why, like why? Why Stanley? What did he do? Y'all say he was this and that. Where? Where's the proof? Where? I want the proof. But, you know, I'm never going to forgive them, move on from this, because Stanley was good. He didn't do nothing bad or nothing. That's all. Exhibit. And your honor, in the sentencing memorandum, I did refer to 
to um, an exhibit one. I decided not to file it as an attachment. It was medical records, and I was going to ask the court to seal it as an exhibit. So it's just records of mental health treatment um, while in custody. You can't exhibit seal if you have six, seven, or you have six. Yes, Your Honor. And I have copies for the court. And I would call uh, Reverend Carter on behalf of Mr. Davis. Uh, sir, if you'd uh, just come up to the podium, sir. Good afternoon. Uh, we're going to ask a few. Well, yeah, we're going to ask a few questions. If you can just raise your right hand. If you saw the swear or affirm, the answers you're about to give would be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Help you got? Yes. And Ms. Mathis, if you're more comfortable being seated, it's whatever you want to do. Just if you get that right there. Sure. Sure. And I think I'm usually pretty easily heard. Um, could you just state your name for the record, please? Eugene Carter. And Reverend Carter, uh, where are you a pastor? Greater Bush Grove Baptist Church. And how do you know the Davis family? Um, I know them um, as their pastor. I've been the, the senior pastor there going on 18 years. Uh, but I knew them uh, prior to that, at least two years prior to that. And did you have occasion to know DeAndre Davis? Yes. Okay. Can you tell the court just a little bit about his family and his upbringing? Okay. Um, I was um, extremely close to his grandmother and great-grandmother. And what uh, were their names for the uh, Deborah Davis. Um, and the great grandmother, um, I can't think of her name right now. Both of them are deceased. Um, the great grandmother went to Tabernacle Baptist Church. His grandmother was at my church, um, sang in the choir, uh, was in several organizations. Um, we were close enough when she'd go on vacation, she'd bring me back souvenirs, um, that type thing. Um, a great supporter of our church, um, spiritually, physically, and financially. Um, I met um, um, DeAndre uh, when he was a toddler, um, him and his, and his brother Don um, and the rest of the family. Um, they were um, participants in our church in every, everything. The grandmother actually um, had them doing everything in church, from vacation, Bible school, school to Sunday school, um, to everything. Even if they didn't want to, um, she had them there. Um, Can you tell the court just a little bit about his parents and sort of what his um, home life was like to your knowledge? I never met his father. Um, I, I did eventually meet his mother. Um, there were some substance abuse issues going on um, back then um, with his mother. And so um, to my understanding, the grandmother had custody of, um, of them. If she didn't have custody, that's who they stayed with, uh, DeAndre and Don. Um, and so that's who they were always with. Um, when they were with her, they were uh, mannerable, um, didn't cause any trouble. They were both quiet, um, didn't mess with anyone. Um, and I talked to them, even if they got out of line, um, she um, was raising, um, like she raised her other kids with an iron fist. Uh, grandmother didn't play, so um, everyone got in line quickly, including the grown folks. Um, she say something, I'd get in line. That's how it was. Um, but um, again, she, she raised them, um, was raising them right. Um, I met the mother uh, a few years later. Um, again, there was uh, some substance abuse issues going on. Um, when my understanding when DeAndre was, was younger, um, there was a huge accident where he got burned pretty bad. Um, that kind of messed with his psyche. Um, um, they brought me in a lot of times to, uh, to counsel him because he'd go in a shell. Um, he wouldn't say anything. He wouldn't, he'd just sit there and just stare. Sometimes he'd just stare right through you. And that was when he was even young. He just, I just felt as though he'd stare right through me as I was talking. He was loving, um, but I can't explain it how somebody would be speaking to them and it's almost like they're looking at you and they're not looking at you. Um, that's how I felt, uh, but we just kept on loving him between myself, my wife, and the rest of the church. Um, we were there for them. And at some point, did his grandmother pass away? The grandmother did pass unexpectedly uh, in her sleep, which was extremely hard, um, extremely hard. I was there um, with the family. Um, it was hard on the family. It was hard on our church. It was hard on me personally 
because again, it was unexpected. Um, which At, she was probably one of the most stable individuals in DeAndre's life. She was the most stable individual in his life. Um, she, um, when she passed, things went south fast. Um, I know um, his mother, she came around, she was clean, and she took custody of them um, and was doing a good job, but she couldn't do what the grandmother was doing. Um, I don't think the level of respect was there uh, for the mother as it was with the, um, the grandmother, with Deborah. Um, but when she passed, um, they stopped coming to church. Um, I lost track of, of um, DeAndre, um, even though I was reaching out trying to, um, to do the best I could, I did. But that's when everything changed, when the grandmother uh, passed. Can you just state your name for the record, please? Yeah. And how are you related to DeAndre Davis? Yeah. Okay. Can you just tell the court a little bit about your pregnancy and DeAndre's birth? Were you married to DeAndre's father? No. Okay, tell us a little bit about DeAndre's father. DeAndre's father What's his name? Thank you. And I know he was in, was he in and out of the home throughout DeAndre's life? Did he also have a substance abuse problem? Yes. And you said that he was abusive. How was he abusive? Uh, physically, mentally, emotional. And that was to you and to your children? Yes. Including DeAndre? Um, at some point, did um, DeAndre suffer some pretty severe um, injuries when he was a child? Yeah. Can you tell the court a little bit about that, please? I'm 
and there was follow-ups on that as recently as age 14, you said? Okay. And um, is it fair to say that you have continued to have bouts of relapse throughout DeAndre's life? Okay. And at some point, did your mother get custody of the children? Okay. Um, tell us a little bit about DeAndre's relationship with his grandmother. Was DeAndre exceptionally close to his grandmother? Yes. Okay. Was she his prime caretaker for yes. most of his childhood? Yes. Okay. And that was a safe home for him? Yes. And at some point, did she pass away? Yes. How old was DeAndre? Uh, How do you feel that affected him? Did you take custody of DeAndre again at that point? Yes. Tell uh, the court a little bit about what the living conditions were um, when De DeAndre came back into your home around that time. And this would have been elementary school into middle school age. Mm -hmm. Okay. And at some point, um, was DeAndre ultimately removed from your home because of the circumstances? He was placed with your sister. Um, are you aware of another time where he suffered a pretty serious physical injury after he was removed from your care? What had happened? What, what had happened to him that he was in the hospital? Okay, do you remember how many times? Okay, and did he have to have any surgeries? How long was he in the hospital for? Okay, tell the judge a little bit about his recovery. Do you, how do you feel like that affected DeAndre after he was shot? He was, I mean, he had to put on his shoulder and put his legs. You know, it was a bit for him. He was scared and I stayed in the hospital with him. I mean, oh, I'm not caught in sleeping. I mean, you know, somebody's going to come there and finish him off. You know, so, I know. Miss mm. Davis, how... Is there anything that you feel like the court should know about your son? Thank you, Ms. Davis. I don't have anything further.
Can you state your name for the record? Can you spell your last name? Do you go by Ms. Reese or, or Ms. Jordan? Uh, Ms. Reese, how do you know Mr. Rashawn Jordan? How long have you had him? I'm sorry, can you speak up a little bit? Ever since he was born. Okay. And, and do you know how old he is right now? He Okay. Now, at the time of the incident, do you know how, how old he was? And at that time, do you know what grade he was in? No. Okay. Do you ever complete ninth grade? No. Okay. Do you ever get his GED or any uh, diploma, high school diploma? So, can you tell us how you got custody of Mr. Jordan? Okay. Uh, who is his father? So, and can you tell me why he was in and out of jail? Drugs. Drugs. And was this constant or was it just one time? Okay. And, was his father ever involved in his life? Yes. Okay, can you tell us how he was involved in his life? Okay, and when he spent time, what did he do with Bashan? Does he, did he show Mr. Bashan his lifestyle? Yes. What, what kind of lifestyle did he live? Can you elaborate a little bit more? And is this what his father showed him that the life should be? Yes, yes, yes. And how often is the father come and go to prison? Okay. And is it? Is Rashawn close with his father? Yes. Okay, where's his father right now? Do you know why, how long he's been in there? This time, maybe four or five years. Okay, do you know the impact that, on, that he has on Mr. Jordan that, since his father been in custody? Rashawn doesn't really show his feelings like that, but I'm sure it does have an impact on and what about his mother? What's his mother's name? I'm sorry, you said it again? And where is she right now? Okay, and can you tell us why she lost custody of Mr. Jordan? So it's like a constant thing throughout his life or just periodically? Okay. And when she's out of custody, does she ever come and visit Mr. Jordan? And, and do you know what kind of lifestyle she lives that she showed Mr. Jordan? Okay. Can you elaborate to the court? What do you mean not the right kind? So is this what she showed Mr. Jordan? Okay, and 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 how and how did you get custody of Mr. Jordan? And when you were raising him, do you? The absence of his parents, do you know if that has any kind of effect on him? And is he close with his mother and father? He loves his mother and his father. Okay. And do you know if Mr. Jordan was aware that the lifestyle that his mother and father was living? And do you have anything else you want to tell to the court about Mr. Jordan?
Do you know the reason why at age 14 that? All I can say is that I've had it in different school systems. T went to my junior. I lied to him down here. And he put it on the school because he had his choices. But when he went to my president's school. Okay. And that's all I have you on. My name's Shamaya, I'm Freeman's cousin. My name is Kiaya, I'm his big sister. A tragedy moment of my life, I experienced a death tragedy that no high schooler should ever have to go through or suffer with. I got a call on February 12, 2021, that my cousin Stanley Antonio Freeman Jr. was killed after being hit by a bullet while driving in his car after school. I couldn't believe it at first until the day we had to lay him to rest. It was the worst day of my life. Stanley was a great kid who had goals for himself and worked hard for his money. He always wanted to work and worked hard for his money just so he can get the hell that he dreamed about. He was never selfish when it came to his family, and he always brought joy to the room. No matter how everyone was feeling that day, he would always make things better. I would say before my cousin Stanley passed away, I was happier as a person, I always motivated myself to be more outgoing, never gave up so easily. But after my cousin died, things changed a little. I noticed. I was losing weight left and right. I became more depressed in a dark hole, and I was just, I just wanted to give up on school, but I know that I was also needing to take care of myself. There would be times when I would just sit up and cry all night, praying and questioning God as to why, <clears throat> as to why my cousin had to leave so soon. Still to this day, I wonder how life would be now if my brother would have made it from surgery or never had that wreck before he'd been shot. I finally realized that if Stanley was still here to this day, he wouldn't want to see me let my life go. He wouldn't want me to be great. I have goals in my life that I need to achieve just so I can make my brother proud. I wanted to graduate, walk across the street, walk across the stage and look up at the sky and tell Stanley that I did it. Everything I'm doing in life always had a purpose, which is why I go so hard at everything I do or say. Death can really put you in the mindset of you're never going to be nothing in life or you are drained as a person like you're not giving it your all. I share this tragedy of losing my brother and many of the things I write because he was special to me. And hopefully, I never have to go through such trauma in my life for a while. I love you, Stanley. We miss you dearly. I love you so much.
state wishes to point out that in this hearing, the victims, the victims of this crime, the victim of this crime, Stanley Freeman and his family, need to be heard with regards to the proposition of sentencing. And in finding that voice, it's important for the state to point to the court and outline the mitigating factors that the defense has attempted to put before the court in making the court's decision regarding this sentence. The defense argues that because these two individuals were young, that their actions were, quote, impulsive, thoughtless reaction rather than a planned attack, the product of thought process of juveniles who are known to be underdeveloped, impulsive, and immature. The facts of this case belie any of that. The facts of this case presented two individuals who loaded semi-automatic weapons on purpose. They used those semi-automatic weapons on purpose. And they fired them 19 times on purpose, with purpose. On page four and five of their sentencing memoranda, they quote, that vehicle seemed to be pursuing the Ultima in on, and an individual leaned out and may have shot towards the Ultima in this dispute. That took place just before their having hunted down Stanley Friedman's car and began shooting at him. So the defense cannot have it both ways. They cannot say or suggest that this was an impulsive, thoughtless action, and in the same time say that they were reacting to this vehicle that was pursuing them shortly before. They go on to say that at page 15, there was no evidence that anyone sought out Mr. Freeman specifically, that no one was hunting him. Again, the facts belie that. They were hunting that car that was circling around the school beforehand. To say that they weren't targeting Mr. Freeman is specious and makes no sense. They further go on to say there's no independent proof at trial that any individual was put at risk other than Mr. Freeman. They can't have it both ways. They fired 19 times down that street, hitting not only Mr. Freeman's car and Mr. Freeman, but other vehicles as well. If that's the case, how is this not impulsive? How is it not hunt, hunting Mr. Freeman? If these facts are true, how can that be? The defense speaks about culpability of these two individuals based upon the brain of a juvenile being less developed. There is sparse records of any diagnosis or treatment in that regard. They have not raised any information that is in any way relevant to culpability. They have not presented any mental health expert or testimony with regards to that issue. There's been no NGRI defense raised at all. With regards to the enhancement factors that have been presented to the court, Again, the defense diminishes or discounts or disregards these enhancement factors, namely enhancement factor four with regards to the age of the victim, Stanley Freeman. As this court will recall, during the pretrial argument, the defense suggested that this particular case of aggravated child abuse could not even be brought before this court because these defendants could not have abused a child. And the court found appropriately 
that that is not what the statute intended. That in fact they could be charged and the jury found them guilty of that. Now the defense wishes to whipsaw that entire argument and say that the enhancement factor of the victim's age is an essential element of the crime and therefore is not an es av available as an enhancement factor. The state would, with respect, think that this is a disingenuous argument. With regards to enhancement factor five, extreme cruelty, the defense suggests that this is an action not of extreme cruelty, apparently. When Stanley Freeman was being chased by these two individuals like an animal and shot at numerous times, ultimately resulting in a motor vehicle accident, leaving Stanley dying in his car, dying on the way to the hospital, apparently that's not cruel enough. With regards to enhancement factor six, serious bodily injury being an element of the offense and therefore not an enhancement factor, again, this the defense cannot have it both ways. Aggravated child abuse involves an element of serious bodily injury, no doubt. But this goes beyond that. Enhancement factor number nine involves the possession of a firearm, which the defense suggests was incidental to the commission of this offense. Incidental to this offense. These semi-automatic weapons were essential to this offense. And their having posed with these items after the fact is offensive and should be recognized by the court as an enhancement factor. Just because these defendants also face a life sentence, this factor should not be overlooked with regards to this offense. Lastly, enhancement number 10, the risk of human life was high. If the defense were to argue that that is not the case here, it ignores the fact that the court and the jury found these defendants fired their weapons 19 times, spreading shell casings across an entire block. And bullets hit Mr. Freeman's car and Mr. Freeman, as well as bullets hitting other, another vehicle along the roadway. The defense suggests that these <clears throat> defendants are not dangerous offenders and hence should not be treated with a consecutive sentence. <clears throat> the state suggests that because Mr. Freeman was hunted by these defendants with semi-automatic weapons that they took great pains to load, point, fire, spray down the street, and then pose with them afterwards suggests that these are dangerous offenders. And with regards to the Booker factors, they simply apply to the life sentence and not to this particular offense. And it is for those reasons that the state believes that these two defendants should be sentenced to consecutive sentences within the maximum range therein. No one would dispute that this is a tragic case. The facts are, are clearly that a young man lost his life. Um, but I would dispute the fact, the, the interpretation of, of what the proof at trial showed with respect to the conduct of these juveniles on that day. When determining an appropriate sentence, the court has to start out in determining not only the range of the punishment, um, but in a case of multiple convictions, if consecutive or concurrent sentencing is appropriate.
And the court's objective in looking at that is to look at the seriousness of the offense, but also look at the necessity of the aggregate sentence that is imposed. So that's why we're directed to look at the principles of sentencing. We go through the mitigating and enhancing factors, which give the court the ability to adjust that sentence for some of the factors in a relative case. That's an option that's before the court outside of that necessary to impose consecutive sentencing. Outside of all of that, in this case, we are looking at all of these factors applied to someone who was a child, who was a juvenile and a child at the time. And I disagree with the state's contention that the book, Booker factors limit the discussion of what Booker, what Booker interpreted, which is a mountain of case law from the United States Supreme Court and Tennessee courts about how juveniles are different how juveniles are different than adults, despite the fact that we transfer them, despite the fact that we put them in prison, they are different. The science shows that they're different. There, there is countless, countless cases from, from both the United States Supreme Court and the Tennessee Supreme Court that have that expert testimony, that have those studies that discuss the juvenile brain. So that is undisputed, I would argue, and it's in the record and it's in the case law. It doesn't need to be presented as to this specific defendant for the court to be able to, to interpret that and apply it in this case. And the United States Supreme Court in Miller versus Alabama said that children are constitutionally different from adults for the purposes of sentencing. I think that that is important for all of us to remember. In looking to this case, we have cited to a number of mitigating factors as to Mr. Davis. Um, the main factor is one that has been highlighted in Tennessee law, which is that he, because of youth lacks substantial judgment in committing an offense. The Tennessee Supreme Court discussed that age, education, maturity, experience, development, and other circumstances are all relevant to the court's determination of a juvenile's ability to truly appreciate the nature of their conduct, the results of their conduct, and the implications of it. And the science supports the fact that the parts of the brain that regulate how you react, how you control your emotions, and how you make decisions is not fully developed until your 20s. Booker talked about that, and the United States Supreme Court has talked about that. So that is something that the court can consider when we're talking about conduct when someone was 16 years old. Additionally, um, we've cited factor two and three, which discuss the the elements of provocation and substantial grounds to explain conduct. You know, it's interesting to hear the state's interpretation of the proof now versus what I feel like we saw in the trial of this case, which was that an incident occurred that took place over the span of a couple of minutes, that a, a car that looked similar to one we saw on video passed an Altima, the Altima turned a corner and a shooting took place over the span of a few seconds and over the course of a few hundred feet. Um, you know, I think the context of what was said in the sentencing memorandum was taken a little bit out of context because in, in arguing that Mr. Freeman was not hunted, the, the state has argued that this case is stunningly similar to state versus love. So I think that the memorandum addresses what that argument was referring to. That was a, a planned attack and retaliation to a shooting where individuals shot into a crowd of people and two individuals died. That was the case that supported consecutive sentencing. I do not agree that that is strikingly similar to the facts of this case, and that was the context which that statement was made in the memorandum. Um, we've also cited to the fact that um, the factor 4035.113.8, which is that someone was suffering from a mental or physical condition that significantly reduces culpability for the offense. So in, in this case, we have a few factors that are really relevant. We've talked about juveniles' brains, um, and the science which is set out and included in the memorandum. Um, also though relevant here is we've got an individual, Mr. Davis, who has been shot before. And there is science and there is, uh, it's discussed within the Booker opinion about how someone who's been through traumatic situations like that and is of a, a young age like that, their brains react differently in circumstances where there's fear and, and reaction like that. And it even quoted in Booker that someone's quote, alarm system is overly sensitive to threats and response. Um, it leads juveniles to be more impulsive, risk takers, and to have poor judgment in how they react to situations. 
Um, here, you know, the court has proof specifically as to Mr. Davis of some of the traumas that he has suffered. He has also been diagnosed with several mental conditions and receives treatment. And those are factors that this court can consider not, not justifying the conduct, that's never been the argument, but in examining mitigation proof that is in this record as to Mr. Davis. Um, it also is relevant to his potential for rehabilitation. Um, you know, the courts are allowed to look at any other factor under, under the law. There's an, uh, sort of an all-inclusive factor under Factor 13. And here, you've got an individual who is 16 years old, who has already been incarcerated for three years, has received mental health treatment, and has actually shown that he's not having those disciplinary issues. He's able to, to follow the rules. He's able to comply with his medications, and he is showing improvement with those. Those are factors that this court is allowed to consider. And there's medical records that indicate some of the medications that he's been taking and his compliance since he's been in custody. There's been no proof of any problems, any violent outbursts, or anything outside of that that would indicate you know, a lack of willingness to, to progress and to rehabilitate. He indicated in his PSI that he hopes to get his GED and do what he can. He, he's aware he's going to serve a lengthy sentence. The court in this case has imposed a life sentence, a life sentence. And we're here discussing whether additional years should be added onto that sentence. Respectfully, I don't think that would be appropriate. The state has also, um, I think glossed over some of the specific mitigation evidence in this case of Mr. Davis's upbringing, which the court has heard proof of, um, and is relevant again to his mental state, his maturity, and his ability to to control and and conduct himself in a certain way. That's all relevant to the court. Um, in response to the state's enhancement factors, um, they have been addressed in our sentencing memorandum. I would argue that consideration of the age of the victim would be inappropriate in this case because Mr. Davis was the same age. I think we are tasked with the responsibility of, of looking at what the legislature meant when they, when they wrote these factors and considered a sentencing range. You know, we're told that the presumption is that in a range, the bottom of, of the range is typically appropriate because the legislature considers the nature and seriousness of the offense in fashioning the ranges of sentences. So we think that that's inappropriately applied here. Um, I think that the case law would indicate that the exceptional cruelty enhancement is not appropriate. Um, the exceptional cruelty enhancement, if you examine the case law, is for conduct such as infliction of pain and suffering for its own sake, torture, gratification, and in, in imposing pain on another. This is not the type of case um, that in review of the case law that this has traditionally been upheld. Um, that's cases where there's additional torture, mental, mental torture, threats, um, and I just I don't think there's any proof that would support that enhancement factor in this case. Um, additionally, enhancement factor six, um, I think that the case law would indicate that because the predicate conviction required serious bodily injury, there is not additional su support or proof that would substantiate that factor. Enhancement factor nine, you know, of course a gun was involved in these offenses. I think um, there's no additional conduct outside of that which has already been punished in count one that would require the application of that factor here. Um, as to factor 10, I, I just don't think that there was any, any proof. I mean, there's proof of, there is proof of one act, one act that took place over, at, at best, a few minutes. Um, and I think that here we're looking at a conviction for aggravated child abuse, but the aggravated child abuse that the, that the state is, has alleged and that Mr. Davis was convicted of is Mr. Freeman being shot and suffering serious bodily injury as a result of that and death. That, that conduct is encompassed in count one and he's been, a, he's been sentenced to life for that. So I think that that's more than sufficient um, to support a concurrent sentence here. As to the two factors that the state has cited that they argue support concurrent or consecutive sentencing, as to Mr. Davis, um, factor B2 um, is, is appropriate for a defendant whose record of criminal activity is extensive. Um, courts have noted that that is not a self-defining factor, that courts are to look at the amount, time, space, and scope of a defendant's record in, in applying this factor. Here, you know, 
Mr. Davis had juvenile court history, but if you examine that history, it is mainly property offenses. They are nonviolent offenses. This conduct is far apart from anything that he previously had. Um, I think the state cited two convictions in support, um, but certainly he has had some history. We would argue that is not extensive as outlined by either the the time or the scope of that conduct. Further, the court is, even if, even if the court finds criminal conduct that's extensive, the purpose of that factor is to protect the public and it's, it's to be used on individuals that there's really no hope of rehabilitating. And I would argue that all the evidence is contrary to that here. You are, you are presented with an individual who has arguably the highest potential for rehabilitation based on his age and based on, on where he is as an individual. He has the ability to, to better himself, to show that he can comply, to get mental health treatment, to get an education. So I don't think that this is a factor that the legislature intended to be applied here. Um, as to a dangerous offender, this is a factor that courts have argued um, is really difficult to apply. It's very subjective, um, and it's, it's to be interpreted in light of also the Wilkerson factor. So in State versus Wilkerson, the courts have been directed that when they're considering applying this factor, they have to also examine the aggregate maximum sentence um, and the severity of the offense. Again, we can't undermine the severity of the offense here. It's the most severe offense that exists in, in our state. But it's also been punished as such. And that has already been imposed as to count one. So here, the aggregate maximum sentence is more than sufficient to punish any conduct um, in, this, in this case. You know, we're not looking at a case where we have felony murder in the perpetration of aggravated child abuse and it's parents who have abused their child over a two year period. There's conduct, 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 and then there's death. That's the type of case where there is a separate factual circumstance that supports the imposition of additional punishment for additional conduct. There is one chain of conduct here and it's been more than sufficiently punished um, by the imposition of a life sentence. Finally, we did cite to um, the weight of all the case law that exists in sentencing of juveniles weighs against consecutive sentencing in this case. Um, and I don't agree that Booker is only applicable to the life sentence. It talks a lot about the punishment of juveniles in the context of life sentences, but it also talks about proportionality. It talks about the fact that juveniles do not have the maturity to have a developed sense of responsibility, that their vulnerability to negative influences is relevant to the court, and that their character and who they're going to be for their, the remainder of their lives simply hasn't been formed yet. And it's essentially too early to assume that someone is a lost cause. That's what that case law really says. That's what the, the courts are tasked with examining when you are sentencing a child to the service of a prison term as an adult. And I think that if you examine those principles here, the imposition of any form of consecutive sentencing would be disproportionate, it would be unreasonable, and I think it would violate the principles of our Constitution. Mathis adequately argue what we essentially argue, and I will adopt the my sentencing memorandum as part of the argument, but just to extend it just a little bit, you know, in, in United States versus Booker, the United States Supreme Court states found three differences between juveniles and adults that established that juveniles cannot, with reliability of reliability, be classified among the worst offenders. Now, those three factors the Supreme Court states was one that juveniles lack maturity and have an underdeveloped sense of responsibility. Number two, that juveniles are highly vulnerable to negative influences and outside pressures and peer pressure. And number three, that the character of juvenile is not as well formed as an adult. That's State uh, versus Booker, you know, from the United States, um, for the uh, Tennessee Supreme Court case. You know, at the time of the crime, Mr. Jordan was 14 years old. He's barely an adolescent. He didn't have a, he didn't graduate high school. He only had a ninth grade education, so he was undereducated. I understand that uh, this is a terrible crime and, a, and a, a horrible result. It's a sad incident. Not only one life lost, I believe all three lives are lost in this case, Your Honor. 
because Mr. Joy and Mr. Davis, they all received life, uh, life sentences, and essentially they're going to spend the, their young, young uh, juvenile life and adult life in prison. And because of, of the actions that have occurred in this case. So he was 14 at the time. He was a young, undeveloped adolescent. He didn't have an education, and he is, he, for 14 years, it's, he, he'd been out of trouble like the grandmother testified. But when he started going to uh, Austin East, that's when the negative influence came into be. And I believe that could be a factor into the consideration because he is a young kid who is subject to negative influence and outside pressure and peer pressure. And the, 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 the mental and, and, uh, and psychological development that he had uh, not having his father and his mother in his life, where they're constantly coming and going from prison. The father and the mother showing him how a life should be, is selling drugs and having guns. And that's all he knew growing up. And, and that's, that's a sad, sad thing. And that's how, it, in fact, there's no excuse for what he did or what had happened. It's just that he is a product of his environment. And, and he will pay. The, the price for what had happened, and the jury had found him guilty, and he is, and your honor sent him to a life sentence. So I believe, based on the, uh, what Ms. Mathis has argued, and uh, the case law is that Mr. Jordan was a young, and I believe that he, uh, he was underdeveloped, immature, impulsive, and in no way excuse for what he did or what had happened, but, uh, and I believe a life sentence where he spent between 25 the next 36 years in his life in prison. It's an adequate sentence. And uh, to address a few uh, factors that in relation to Mr. Jordan is that I understand the state found enhancement factor of the, the, uh, the extensive criminal record. So, you know, uh, I believe the state submitted some judgment from the juvenile court. Now those, I believe there was uh, four convictions, but most of them are theft convictions, Your Honor. And I don't believe anybody was hurt in that incident. It was un unrelated to any crime that had happened because when he was growing up, he was known to his father stealing cars, selling drugs, and that's what he was used to. And that's when he engaged the same lifestyle, but not detached from shooting and, and killing people. I feel like the theft crimes has, it's not a violent crime. No one was hurt, but it doesn't excuse for what he did, and he did accept responsibility and admit to his guilt for that. And, and that doesn't really show that he has an extensive record or, or a dangerous offender. And this is the first case that he'd been convicted on this matter, and I, I, I would like you to take that into consideration. The, other than that, Your Honor, I believe that a just punishment in this is life in prison. Is, is, is reasonable, and, uh, and I will ask that he be sentenced at the bottom concurrently. Uh